Morning, Ansley. What's good, Professor? Uh, things are going fine, I guess. <laughs> How about for you? Yeah, it's okay, I guess. We got a couple minutes left. Three people in here today. All right, usually it's like six to seven, eight, maybe. You know what? I forgot a calculator today. Okay, Daniel, you're my man. When we get to section three, 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 section four, two, you're the man. I'll just be asking for computations of like E, the number E, 2.7-ish, to some power. So it's like E to the X on your calculator. So I'll just call it out and you yell it back. Right. E squared, something like this. It won't be many. I guess we can go ahead and get started. We're about 45 seconds early, but people will walk in as they come. So do you have any questions about anything? The tests? The home? On the test, there was a, there was this question that was, it asked for the equation, it asked for the equation of I. And I'm pretty sure I got, like I knew the answer. Mm -hmm. Like I even put it into my test calculator to make mm -hmm. sure. Okay. And so it didn't like the format. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I know uh, there are issues with the way WebAssign interprets answers. And so I'm in the process of going through and looking through. I haven't come across yours yet. But I oh, yeah. Are you talking about the test? Yeah. There was one, Nick, in particular, you had one that was like, Instead of using uppercase letters, he used lowercase, but it was perfectly right. It's the same thing. So, this is the type of thing. Right. Right. So, I'm in the process of going through and giving everyone credit back. Okay. Um, when I'm done with your test, you'll get a, an email that says, Hey, I've checked your test. These are the questions I adjusted with this amount of points. And then your final grade is now this. Okay. Everyone's test scores were quite well, though, quite good. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm happy with them. I hope you guys are too. <laughs> Even without the correction, but I'd, I'd guess most people are pretty happy with them. Anything else about the test or class? There's no midterm for this class, right? Nope. But okay. today is the midterm day, right? Today is the middle of the semester. So, no, there's no midterm test. Um, no, no, no test. Just one more, and that's coming up uh, in a bit here. I don't have on this computer, I don't think I have the, the PDF. Good morning. Pull a blackboard here, but yeah, there's just the uh, the two tests and the final exam. The next test is not until November 2nd. So it's one, two, three and a half weeks away. And that test is on chapters three to five. Um, 
I'm guessing that's the uh, construction that they're doing outside. Yeah. Great. <laughs> I'm not concerned about you, you, you folks in here, but maybe online that'll cause some issues with the sound. Hey, morning. Any, any questions about anything? Test or? Okay. Well, we'll go ahead and get started then with class. Uh, it's good to see everyone here. Um, today's material is from sections 3.3, 4.1, and 4.2. Um, it's more or less uh, div division of polynomials as well as exponential functions. The sections 4.1 and 4.2 are, 4.1 is any exponential and 4.2 is specifically the natural exponential with the, with the special number E um, as the base. And this first part, 3.3 on division of polynomials is, um, it's a tricky one. Uh, but it, for the most part, follows your learned pattern of long division. Okay, so we're just going to do a long division problem first. <laughs> this may seem silly, but uh, that's what we're going to do. And the reason is polynomial division is basically the exact same process. You ask yourself the same question, but you're using different things all together. Uh, so let's just pick up a nice easy number here to work with. Two goes into, oh, let's see, 432. Okay. You could easily do this on a calculator, but bear with me here. So we have this thing that's doing the dividing, and we have this number that we are dividing, right? What goes inside is what you are dividing. What you're dividing by is outside. Um, and there's this re repetitive process where you ask yourself, what number do I multiply this by to get this? Or as close to this as possible without going over. So you're, you're just asking yourself that question over and over. Two times two is exactly four. So I write it here and I subtract it from just that column. Then I bring down the next number and I ask myself the same question. What number do I multiply this by to get as close to this as possible without going over? The answer is one. So I write that here. I multiply, I subtract, I get one. And then I bring down the next one. Same question. I multiply this by what? To get as close as possible to 12, and it's, it's clearly six. That gives me 12. There's nothing left over, there's zero remainder. So I can write this in a sort of a weird way. I can say 216 plus nothing over two. Or 216 plus zero, which is 216. Okay, this is long division, right? This section, four point three point three. Um, is all about this process, the same process with um, polynomials. So let's say we wanted to do this division. Six x cubed plus x squared twelve x plus five. We're dividing it by this. Well, <clears throat> it's the exact same process. Um, we go term by term and we ask ourselves, what number do I need to multiply this by to get me as close as possible to this thing? And then to this thing, and then to this thing, et cetera, down the line, okay? Instead of working with numbers and places, we're working with terms and polynomials or monomials, right? So usually in this process, we only concern ourselves with the lead coefficient or the lead uh, the lead term here, 3x. 
Uh, we don't really care about the minus four. That takes care of itself. Now, how many of you have seen this before? You've seen it? No? Kind of, yes. Okay, no problem. That's why I'm doing this. So, great. Um, now, what we write here is actually not a number always. It also involves variables. So I'm going to do some scratch work here on the side. The question is, what do I multiply that number on the left, 3x, I'm forgetting about the minus 4, it'll take care of itself, to get 6x cubed? You look at this coefficient and you say 2. You look at the variable and you say x squared. Okay? Now this is what you write over here. Just like before. And what you write down here is just like before. It's 2x squared times all of this. So that's 6x cubed minus 8x squared. And just like before, we perform a subtraction. So we get 6x cubed minus 6x cubed is nothing. x squared plus 8x squared is 9x squared. And then we just repeat the process. So a little scratch work on the side. 3x times what gives us 9x squared? 3 x. So we do the multiplication again, and I already forgot a step, but we have to bring down the next thing. We do this process over, we multiply through, we get 9x squared minus 12x. Nothing. Bring down the next number. We ask ourselves again, what do we multiply this by to get five? And this is a little tricky. Oops, Chris. This is a little tricky. Because now I need to work with 1 over x, right? So we're going to go ahead and stop right there. Because what we found is something that is of lower degree than what we're dividing by. If we had come up with a number here that was smaller than 2, we would have stopped, right? We would have said plus 1 half. There's a remainder of 1 over 2. Right? So here, we've got something that's of lesser degree than this, which means we found the remainder already. The remainder is 5 in this division process. So how do we write that? Well, we write that just like I did over here. You take the remainder, and you divide it by what you're dividing by over here. And I'll explain that here in the scratch work. At this final step, we're actually going to multiply by 3x minus 4. And we'll ask ourselves that same question. What do we multiply this thing by to give us just 5? What we've got left over. And the answer is pretty simple. It's 5. Uh, yep. Yeah. Five over three x minus four. Right, this will cancel out in multiplication to give us just five. So what we've got over here is plus five over three x minus four, and that's the quotient. That's the division of that polynomial by that line, and that's the whole process. Okay, I heard somebody say something online, but is there a question? 
No, I just answered the question. Oh, okay. So the, was the question. Very good. Okay. So there we go. That's number six. Um, and that's polynomial long division. There's an alternative method to this in one case. We divide by a line here, right? When you're dividing one polynomial by a line, there's another process called synthetic division, which relies only on what these coefficients are, six, one, negative 12, and five. Um, and if you can remember how to do it, it is, I would say, faster than doing this. Um, it definitely involves less writing than this. Uh, so if you want to take the time to learn that, that's okay. That's great. Okay. That's a, that's a good skill to have, I guess. But that's the only case you can use it is when dividing by lines. Okay. You cannot use it for division by anything else. So it's, it's a good thing to have, but it is highly restricted to just one simple class of polynomial division. The next example that I was going to do was number seven. And you cannot use it in this one because you're not dividing by a line. So we've got number seven, x squared plus four. Dividing. Two x to four. X cube um, for me personally, throughout my entire mathematics career, I remember learning synthetic division at one point in time in high school, and then I remember never using it again because there were all these other problems like this where you just couldn't use it. So it seems kind of strange for me to hold on to this tool that was a little bit faster, but used in only a specific scenario. It seemed a little strange to do that when I could just perform the exact same process no matter the problem. So that's what I held on to, was the process, the general process that works no matter the problem. Um, yeah, so it's up to you. Um, your mathematical tastes are, they're your tastes, and that's fine. So, synthetic or otherwise. All right, x squared plus 4, 2x to the fourth minus x cubed plus 9x squared. We're just going to ask ourselves the same question over and over and over again. x squared times what gives us 2x to the fourth? That's 2x squared. Let me multiply through. We get 2x to the fourth, 8 x squared, uh-oh, is that a problem? Things don't line up? No, just line them up, just line them up. And then when you use your subtraction, you'll see what, what comes out, right? We get nothing here, we're subtracting nothing here. So negative x cubed is still here. And there at the end, we've got just x squared. Okay. No harm done. All right, ask yourself the same question. x squared times what is negative x cubed? Negative x, okay. So we get negative x times x squared is negative x cubed. Negative x times 4 is negative 4x. Four uh oh. Still not a problem. How many x's do we have up here? None. Just here. Okay. Whenever you don't have anything, it's totally fine to write something. Just make sure what you've written is nothing. 
should be too different than nothing, right? So we do the subtraction. Nothing here. Oh, there's nothing there. So x minus okay, it's just an x, and then zero x minus negative four plus four x. That's the square. This is a good problem because there's a lot of missing information that we kind of need, right? So whenever it's missing, as you've seen me do, just put in placeholders. Placeholders of zero. Um, and you just keep going with this whole process until what you get is of something of degree lesser than what you were dividing by. But we're still on the level here with x squared and x squared. So x squared times what is x squared? One. We multiply through and we get to x squared plus four. This was zero. This is a plus zero x. Subtraction, we get nothing. 4x plus 4. That has degree lesser than this, so we are done. We write plus the remainder 4x plus 4 over the divisor x squared plus 4. And that is what. Okay. Questions on polynomial long division. Okay, I've got one more question from this section. Um, pretty much all of the homework questions are, hey, divide this, find this remainder, use synthetic division, don't use synthetic revision, uh, division, um, except for one little section of problems. Um, it says to, uh, oh, uh, let's, hmm. Let me give you a hypothetical situation here. Let's say you've done some division. You're taking x minus 2 and you're dividing some polynomial. I don't, I don't know what it is. I don't care what it is. But what I do care about is you get stuff plus zero remainder. That's the key point here. Let's say you've done some polynomial division problem with some something that you're dividing by over the polynomial and you get nothing left over. Could you tell me what is a zero of this polynomial? Uh, what is Tell me answers to those two questions. These are part B and C sometimes of questions from this section. Is it two? Two is a zero, that's true. Yes, exactly. And how do you know that? Just solve for x for the factor. Solves the factor. Uh -huh. Comes from this, really. If you divide a polynomial by another polynomial and you get nothing left over, that means what you divide it by is a factor. Right? That means that you can write this polynomial as x minus 2 times stuff and you get the polynomial. So the zeros of this are zeros of the whole polynomial. 
because whenever this factor is zero, you get zero times stuff, which is of course zero. Okay. So again, if you have a zero remainder, whatever you divide it by is a factor. And the zeros of that factor are zeros of the original polynomial as well. So these are some kind of side questions. But this other class of question um, asks you to construct a polynomial. Um, this is question number 63. Uh, and what they're asking for is for you to construct a polynomial that has third degree. So it looks something like x cubed plus x squared. plus x, plus one, maybe something like this. But it's got different numbers in here and there. But instead of giving you points, x, y coordinates, they tell you zeros. So they say, give the equation to a polynomial of third degree with the zeros minus one, one, and three. Problems like this aren't too difficult. If you remember what you just talked about here. Can you name me, Nick, a factor of this degree three polynomial? A factor, that's a zero. X plus one is a factor. Nick, you're great at throwing the voice. Well, how about you give me a different one? Perfect, all right. Wow. There we go. X plus one, X minus one, and X minus three. They want the equation. There it is, y equals the product of those factors. If you want to take the time to multiply it out, be my guest, but this is, this is what you have. Okay, you would multiply it out and get something like x cubed plus da 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 plus three. I don't know what's in the middle, stuff. But does this polynomial have these zeros? Yes. Negative one makes this zero. One makes this zero, three makes this zero. So it has the right zeros. And it has the right degree because it's x times x times x, so we're good. Okay, so this is just a way to construct a polynomial that has the right information in terms of zeros. That's, that's the only other kind of question that they've got in this section, really. So I'm gonna move on from this section unless you have questions. No? No? All right. I can tell you don't have any questions. You got this. It's good. All right. So section 4.1 is on exponential functions. And I pulled just three questions from this section, numbers 11, 13, and 21. Um, 11 is sketching a graph, and so is 13. This is a big, um, big portion of this section, just graphing an exponential function. Just to, again, give a little more background on what we're doing here. Exponential functions are different from polynomials in that exponentials have a fixed base and a variable power, whereas polynomials have variable bases and fixed powers. Okay. Um, so what you're plugging into is the exponent here. You're not plugging into the base like we've been doing. So uh, they wanted in number 11 just a graph of 2dx. And they wanted that uh, done by making some table of values. So here we go. X to the X. This one's not so bad. 
we'll plug in just some numbers like this. And then we'll just plot them with everything. Okay, I'll start with the positives and work my way back. Two to the third is two times two times two, which is eight. Two squared is just two times two, which is four. Two to the first is two. Two to the zero, something to remember here is just one. To the negative one, that's one over two to the first, which is one half. The negative two is one over two squared, which is one over four. And negative three is one over two to the negative two to the three, which is one over eight. Okay? So for a graph, not so bad. Starting from the left this time. One eighth is pretty small. One fourth is a little larger. One half, larger yet. One, two, four, and eight. There you go. A graph of two of the x. All right. On the same graph, number thirteen. One third to the x. No different. Now we've got a fractional base, but it's no different. When you're plotting a graph of a function, we just make a table. So we just pick some values. And we can keep what we get. Let's pick the same numbers negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three. And then we'll sort of see how they compare throughout. And again, this computation isn't too bad. One third, negative three is. 3 to the third, which is 27. Remember with negative exponents, you take the reciprocal of it or you bring it down into the denominator, which 1 over 1 third is 3. So there's that. I'm going to do this quickly now because I think we get it. This would be 1 third to the negative 2, which is 3 squared. This would be 3 to the first. This is 1. This is 1 third to the first, which is 1 third. This is one third squared, which is one over three squared. It's one squared over three squared, so it's one ninth. And this is one twenty seven. And then we'll plot it in a dotted line at zero. Wouldn't you know? We still get one. At negative one, though, we've got the reverse happening. We're at one here, at negative two, we're at three. At negative three, we're at nine. At one, we're at one third. Did I write things? Yeah, they're they're a little bit slanted here. Sorry about that. At one ninth, one twenty seven. What did I mix up? Did I? Uh... Oops. Oops. Yes. Thank you. Wow. Here we're at three. Here we're at nine. Wow. Here we're at twenty-seven. We up here somewhere. Okay. Now we're good. Oh my goodness. Thank you. 
another way to write this problem is three to the negative x. This is pretty pretty typical. Whenever you've got some base to a positive power, and this base is bigger than one, you're going to see this growth happening from the left to the right. Whenever you've got this negative power with some positive base greater than one, you're going to have this negative, uh, this, this decreasing happening. Um, this is typically called exponential growth. This is typically called exponential decay. So uh, this, these problems say use a calculator if necessary. Um, I would hope you could do this without a calculator, right? It's just, if you pick values for your power that are easy enough, then you can plot a good graph without using it. Okay. Um, number 21, unless there are questions on graphing, on graphing exponentials. Okay, so the next one is question 21. And this is a question where you are supposed to determine what the function is. So if A is some unknown, okay, it's an exponential function, but A is unknown. And you have two pieces of information. You know, when you plug in zero, you get one. I think that's pretty obvious no matter what A is, unless it's zero. But the other piece of information is it goes through two nines. What's the equation? Here it is. Yep. How'd you figure it out? Three squared is not. He asked himself this, right? He plugged in two here, nine from here, and he asked, okay, what works? What about negative three? I guess that works for that point, right? So at this point in, in our problem, we have either plus or minus three to the x. If I gave you a graphic picture of this and said it looked like this, which one would it be? Plus or minus? Um, what does negative 3 to the x look like? a really strange thing, I think. Whenever x is positive, sorry, whenever x is, I should say, even, this is positive. Whenever x is odd, this is negative. What happens in the in-between times? Does it behave like a positive or behave like a negative? Sorry, behave like a, yeah, you know what I mean? Does it sort of oscillate back and forth above and below the axis? What happens? That's extra thinking. Beyond this plus. You can think about that. What happens when we've got an negative base for our exponent? Okay, that's it for section four one. It's literally graphing exponentials and then coming up with formulas for them. So I'll move on to four two unless you've got questions on exponentials.
No? Okay. Well, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. The next section, 4.2, is a, for the most part a repeat of the previous section, 4.1. Um, but instead of dealing with any exponential base, we're dealing with a specific one, which is E. This is the natural exponential and logarithmic. Base. E. So E is just some number, okay? It's it's like two point seven more or less. It has a lot of applications. It's got lots more decimals by the way. It's got it pops up in all sorts of places in mathematics. Um, all sorts of places, and uh, we'll do a couple example problems here that are not problems like this, they're application problems because of that. Um, but it's just a number. Whenever you see E, it's probably not a variable. Okay, if, if it is a variable, whoever wrote the question was, was a poor question writer because it shouldn't really be used like that. I think it should be used primarily as this value, 2.718. Um, and because it's such a strange number like this, computing things like this is difficult. E squared, right? I don't know what that is off the top of my head. I could multiply this out twice, but that would take a bit of time. So, I'm suggesting you should use your calculator to compute things like this if you need to, okay? Um, because they do ask you to make graphs of these things. So here we go. Um, question seven is to make a graph of two plus e dx. And they want you to graph it making a table of values. So I asked uh, Daniel earlier, and he graciously agreed to be my computer, because I forgot my calculator today. Let's make a table of values and graph this. Okay, so we've got x, 2 plus e to the x, and we're going to plug in just a few values here. We're going to plug in the usual negative 2, negative 1, 0, and minus 2, and then we will plot these things. So I'll do the easy one here. Two plus one is three. And then, thanks everyone for helping out. I'll do the other two ones, I guess. This one, uh, two plus 2.718 is four plus seven. And then, so we'll get Daniel, maybe start computing and fill these things in. Uh, yeah, negative two is 2.13. Yeah, you, you, I can't graph accurately to within one, so just round it to the tenths for now. Okay. Negative one is two point three. Perfect. Two point four. And uh, positive two is nine point four. Okay. Yeah. There's other decimals clearly, right? But when you're plotting, you don't have the precision. I don't have the precision. Maybe you do. I don't know how thick your pencil that is. You know, the difference between Two point two point uh, one three five, which is like here, maybe, and two point one three six, which is like right on it. Yeah, you don't have that precision. So just slap a slap a point about a two point one three five uh, over here, clearly, and then at negative one we've got two point four, which is maybe right there. Three four point seven one eight. 
and at two we've got nine point four. Okay, Daniel, thank you so much. Really appreciate that. Math professor that forgets his calculator. I'm probably not going to get a raise this year. Yeah. All right. There it is. It looks just like the other ones, right? It looks just the same way. And it should. It's just a number, right? We did 2 the x. It's not that different than 2.718 to the x, right? Don't be freaked out when you see this. It's just a number. It's a little more than 2, a little less than 3. Okay, the other question that I wanted to go through here was nine. And from this, we can do it. Because there's one kind of exponential that we haven't graphed yet. It's sign in front of the base. Okay, now this is different than what I wrote on the board earlier. This is not the same as negative e. It's totally different. This has a negative sign in front of everything. That's what that is. But this negative sign is within the base. Okay? So, Nick, I don't think I need your computations for this because we can just use that. Well, just subtract two from everything and then throw a negative sign in. Okay. okay. So yeah, to graph this, we just make the same kind of table. And like I said, we're going to use this over here. So when we plug in negative zero, we're going to get 0 0.1 through 5. And then negate it. When we plug in negative 1, we're going to get 0.4. And then we'll negate it. Zero, we're going to get negative one. Right? Three minus two, negate it. Or just e to the zero is one. One, two, it's 2.718. And for two, we get 7.4 ish. So, we should have known what this was going to look like, I think, before even doing any of this. Right? Because what does this negative sign in, fr in, in front of the function do? It reflects it, yeah, across, yes, across the axis. So it takes this and it just flips it down. So it should look something like this. Well, about that. And it does. It's negative 0.135, negative 0.4, negative 1, negative 2.718, negative something larger down there. Okay. Looks a little different than just reflecting that one because that one's been shifted up too. But if we shifted it down to and then reflected it, it would be exactly this. Okay, that's, that's it for the natural exponential, except for a couple application problems. Questions? Yes, Nick? Just feel like a little like fuzzy. Sure. E, so E is like a constant, sort of like how like pi is. Yes, it's just like pi. Okay, because I don't know, because I was like confused at first because I thought like E was like sort of like variable, but it's like what can you play with it in like situation? No, yeah, your, your comment, like pi, is exactly spot on. Um, pi, you know, we all know this, know and love this number, it's like 3.14. Lots of decimals that go on, right? And you've heard these decimals never repeat. 
and they never end. Okay. You can't write this as a fraction of integers, it's irrational. Um, it's also transcendental, which means you can't write down, you can't write down a polynomial with integer coefficients and have x minus pi as a factor. Pi is not the zero to any polynomial with integer coefficients. Like these are other things about pi that maybe you didn't know, but e is the same way. It's got tons of decimals that keep going, that never repeat. It's irrational because, because of that, right? And likewise, it's transcendental. You can't write down a polynomial that has x minus e as a factor if that polynomial has only integer coefficients. So it's, it's just a number like pi, like other transcendentals, like other irrationals, um, that has no decimal n and no decimal repetition. So usually Nick, it's just rounded, right? Um, in practice in engineering, if you need to use a formula with E in it, in biology, if you're trying to estimate some growth of bacteria or some, some logistic curve of something, and you're doing, like you're actually making a, hey, I'm gonna have X number of bacteria at a certain date, the more precise you want your guess to be, the more decimal of E you use. Right? Out in the field, people use three to estimate because they're, unless they have the calculator with them, out in the field, people are making rough guesses. So they round these things to three. I want to know, because my model has like an E to the X in it, I want to know out in the field what my model would predict for seven. Well, I can't do 2.718 in my head to the seventh, but I can calculate out three to the seventh rather quickly in a sheet of paper. So I'll use that as my rough guess. Then when I get home, I'm gonna use my calculator with 20 decimals to give a really precise estimate. In practice, that's what happens. In math, we use E because it's the perfect infinite string of decimals. So yeah, just a number, just like five. Other questions? Yes. Pass and tote. Yep. Uh, any exponential, right? It's of an exponential, right? Okay. Yeah, ask those. So an asymptote is the end behavior. It's, it's sort of what happens as we go out to infinity. Um, there are two kinds that are vertical. Okay, vertical ones are kind of like, what, where do we shoot off to infinity plus or minus vertically? Horizontal. It's where do we go off to infinity horizontal? Um, So it's very related to this idea of end behavior that we had before. Uh, let's, let's take a look at um, this. 2x goes to what? As x goes to infinity. Let's look at it that way. As x gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, what does 2 to the x go to? Infinity. Yeah. We see that in the graph. It looks like this. It just keeps going up and up and up. The bigger the x you choose, the bigger the y becomes. Okay? There's no vertical asymptote here. Because there's no x value, you can't put your finger on a single x value where it shoots up to infinity there. That's a vertical asymptote. If there is an x value where your function just rockets off to infinity there, that's an asymptote vertically. 
we can easily come up with graphs of those, examples of those. Here's one, one over x. The graph looks like this. Right here at zero, at x equals zero, our graph shoots down to negative infinity and shoots up to positive infinity. That's a vertical asymptote. Okay. Horizontal asymptotes, this also has one. Can you give me a y value where our function shoots off to infinity? Zero. Right here, at this height. This graph suggests that at zero for y, we shoot off towards infinity in the x. Just thinking about it the other way, right? That's a horizontal asymptote. So for exponentials, we're just asking ourselves that same question. Is there a y value that we can obtain when x goes to plus or minus infinity? And here it is. Two of the x goes to what? And x goes to negative infinity. If you plug in more smaller and smaller and smaller values, what does two of the x get closer and closer and closer to? We plug in negative one and we get one half. Negative two, we get one fourth. Negative five, we get one thirty seven. Zero. These are fractions that are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. But no matter how big I make or how small I make this negative number, it's just going to be a fraction that's still positive, but a smaller fraction. So what we've, what we've written down here is essentially, there's this dotted line here at y equals zero, that as you go further and further and further to the left, it gets closer and closer and closer and closer. That's an asymptote. There you go. So that's how you discover it. You look at limits. As, as you go further and further in one direction, further and further in the other direction, do you arrive at a single value? If you do, you've got an asymptote there. Um, and then, I, as I discussed earlier with vertical, you're looking at places where it rockets off up and down to infinity. Great question. Any others? I can't believe it. Um, we uh, we still got 24 minutes, and I'm pretty much done with the problems. That never happens. So this is this is interesting. Interesting. Alrighty. Uh, I just wanted to do some application questions with you. Um, the uh, the section homework here is like like a few problems of graphing and making computations, and then the rest of our application questions. That right there should tell you, hey, this E pops up everywhere in the world. Um, so there's things on uh, medical drugs, radioactive decay, skydiving, concentrations of fluids um, or mixtures, logistical growth, bird populations, world populations, tree diameters, and then interest and finance. This stuff is everywhere. So I had the world population one down just because it's, uh, you know, I don't know, something that I thought was interesting. Did anything else that I just list out, did you find that interesting? Anyone interested in uh, pharmaceuticals? 
How about uh, radioactive decay? How about skydiving? Okay, there's one. Okay, we'll, we'll start with that one. Skydiving. A skydiver jumps from a reasonable height above the ground. Reason. What is a reasonable height? I'm going to go ahead and say it's a high number, big number. The air resistance she experiences is proportional to her velocity, and the constant of proportionality is 0.2. It can be shown that the downward velocity of the skydiver at time t is given by some equation. Here we go. This is her velocity. It is 180 minus e to the negative 0.2t. Find the initial velocity of the skydiver. How fast was she traveling at the very beginning? But what time corresponds to the very beginning? Zero. Zero. At zero seconds, this whole thing started. I would hope, right? Okay, so A, when T equals zero, B of zero, that's her velocity at time zero. It just makes sense, we're at the beginning. Equation says we're 180 times one minus E to the zero point two negative. Oops, it's a negative there. Yes, sir. Okay, just making sure times zero. Well, what's e to the zeroth power? One. What's one minus one? Zero. This should correlate with what you expect. At the very beginning, she was standing there. She's not moving. Zero feet per second. Okay, that's exactly what we should expect. Uh, B, find the velocity after five seconds and after 10 seconds. This is where I, again, regret forgetting my calculator at home. <laughs> I don't know what these numbers are. 180 times one minus e to the negative 0.2 times five. This one is 180 times one minus e to the negative 0.2 times 10. Can do some of these computations. I can't do them all. Whatever those numbers are, that's how fast she was going. Okay. Um, I'm curious though, how fast are these numbers? So in the first five seconds, her speed increases from zero to 113.8. In the next five seconds, her speed increases by less than half that increase. She's slowing, the rate at which she's speeding up is slowing down, right? So I'm curious, what's her terminal velocity? What is the, largest speed, according to this model, that she'll obtain. Exactly. Mathematically, what's the horizontal asymptote? <laughs> so 
It's 180. Right? Where is it? It's 180 minus. Let's, let's look at this. You can get off your calculator for a minute. 180 minus 180 e to the negative 0.2 of t, right? Okay. As t gets really big, what happens to e to the negative t? It goes to two to the x goes to infinity, right? As x gets really big, but what about two to the negative x? As x gets really big. You said it earlier. Zero. Zero. All right, so let's think about this. We've got the same form here, e to the negative power. What happens to e to the negative power as the time goes on forever? It goes to zero. So we get 180 minus zero as time goes on really far. So what's your terminal velocity? 180. No calculator needed. Just, just think about it. Okay, let's see what the uh, rest of the question goes on to. Draw a graph, of course, and then find terminal velocity. Done, check. Okay, we're not gonna graph it. We've got several points here already, and we can plot those and we'd be good. Okay, let's go on, we got more time. Nine of four, 16 minutes. Uh, mixtures and concentrations, any chemistry buffs out there? Okay, guys. settle down people, settle down. Logistic growth. Logistic growth uh, is something that we've seen a lot of in the last 10 months. The whole coronavirus thing. Every model that predicts what it's going to end up at is a logistic growth model. Every model. Okay, bird population. Yeah, we can try it. This one has to do with animal populations. Okay, so 27, logistic growth. Uh, animal populations are not capable of unrestricted growth. You can think of COVID. It, it can't be, it can't, the number of cases can't go to infinity. Impossible, there's not enough people. So there's a restricted amount. Uh, so animal populations are not capable of unrestricted growth because of limited habitat and food supplies. Under such conditions, the population follows a logistic growth model. Here's the logistic growth model. The population at time t, this is the animal population at time t. Um, yeah, okay, is this. Some number d divided by one plus some number k times e, that's the actual number e, not a variable, to the negative c, which is still just some number, times t. Okay, it says, of course they do, where c, d, and k are positive con con uh, constants, and here they are, of course they do. 1,200, k is 11, c is 0.2. I don't know why they do that so often. Here's the equation generally. Now here's the specific equation. It's the specific. Okay. The fish were introduced into the pond at time t. So this tells us the population in a small pond at time t, and they were introduced at time zero. The fish were. The animal that they're talking about. 
Part A, how many fish were originally in the pond? Well, originally at T0. This is just a computation problem again. It's 1200 over 1 plus 11 e to the 0, which is 1. So 1 plus 11, so we get 12. Clearly, there were 100 fish to begin with. Okay. Um, this problem I can tell is, is going to be a, a bit more just computing things. So find the population after 10, 20, and 30 years. So B, with 10. E of uh, I don't know what those numbers are, but someone could compute them. We hope they're higher than 100. For anyone that's looked into logistic growth in the last 10 months, you've come across this formula. And then you've maybe asked yourself, what are these numbers for COVID and how are they determined? That's the tricky question. That's the really tricky one. But it's something that you can do. You can find out from data that's available online. Anyone have these values yet? Oh, no, I don't. I can't do either the negative six in my head. No way. Get a calculator out. I can start. So long. Uh, for P, P catch is um, it's the uh, four four hundred eighty two. Oh my goodness. Point. Uh, Let, let's go. We're working with fish here, so we can't have a point. So we'll just shoot it for you too. Okay. And then the next ones. Um, nine hundred zero ninety eight. Then. Okay, so this is the fish population. At time zero, we've got 100. So one, two, three. Okay, so moving my axis. Okay, so, so 100 at time zero. At time 10, we've got 482. 1, 2, 3, 4, 82. That's a pretty big jump right there. And then at time 20, we have 998. So 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Right there. And then at time 30, we've got almost 1,200. So and you see this curve starting to limit itself off pretty quickly. So then the question is, I'm guessing next, yeah, what is the maximum approximate, approximate maximum um, fish value? 1,200. Don't think too hard about that one. Yeah, 1,200. Because remember, this goes to zero as t goes to infinity. So we've got 1,200 divided by 1 plus zero. 
it's 1200 over one. So the maximum population that this small pond that can, that's for supporting the uh, fish is 1200, according to this model. The scientist has to determine what these coefficients are. See max population. E at infinity is how we'll that. Is And honestly, it's, it's probably a more worthwhile question figuring these coefficients out. Doing computations with your calculator is one thing. Determining the values with which to compute is probably a whole different and more worthwhile story. We still got seven minutes. Okay. Uh, bird population, world population, tree diameter, finance. Tree diameter. For certain types of trees, the diameter D in feet depends on the tree's age, according to the growth model. Um, they give us a logistic model, and they, they ask for the diameter of a 20-year-old tree. Fascinating subject. That's not a fascinating problem. They, they give us a logistic model, just like this, and they ask us to compute for 20, D equals 20, or T equals 20. So you, you would change the numbers and do the exact same computation you did there. Sorry. But yeah, really fun question. Yes. Does the graph shown confirm your calculations? Oh, yeah, part C there. Um, the answer would be yeah, it does. Yeah, so the graph that they give <clears throat> This one, they have this this dot, this twelve hundred here. They've got a dotted line, and they show the graph is going like this. Does that graph suggest that the maximum population is twelve hundred? Yeah, because we're getting closer and closer to this twelve hundred line. So yes. And then if we, if we check these other values. Oh, you know what? It actually looks like it doesn't start off with uh, uh, it looks like it doesn't start off with um, 100. Did I say 100? Yeah, I should say 100. It looks like it, the graph is a little bit off on where it starts. But aside from that, it looks like it's pretty good. 400-ish for 10. 900-ish for 20, close to 1,200 for 30. It's pretty close. You would just look at a couple of these values. 0, 100, 10, 482, these points, you would just check the graph. Seems to correspond to what you've got. Um, the finance one. I think the, um, in my history of teaching things like this, students sometimes find the, the finance ones interesting because uh, you get to ridiculous totals of money really fast with exponential growth. So um, some of these questions about if you invest $8,000 into an account and it's compounded continuously, how much money do you have in 12 years if your interest rate is some certain percentage? It's a ridiculously large amount of money. Um, so let me, let me just go through that real quick. So the amount at time t when you invest in a continuously compounded investment is computed through this formula. Your principal amount either an AL or an LE here, I can't remember. Money is always AL, right? Oh, great, this is going on YouTube. 
times e to the r two. R is your rate, your interest rate. You need to write it at decimal. And then t is the time t uh, in years. Okay, so they say right away at the beginning in one of these problems that uh, you invest $8,000, that's your principal amount. Uh, your rate is going to vary. And they suggest something as high as 7%, as a decimal that's 0.07. And you invest it for 12 years. So let's see how. Who's the youngest in this class? We have 20 year olds. Okay, that's an easy number to work with, a 20 year old. Okay. In 12 years, you'll be as old as me. Okay, so think about this right now. Do you have eight grand to put away? You don't need to answer that. Could you put 800 away? Probably, you could probably like ask your relatives like, I need 50 bucks, you know, or I need like 20 bucks and you might be able to scrounge 800. Okay, now let's just think, when you're my age now, 7%, how much money are you gonna have? Go ahead, someone compute this. Eight fifty six. That's it. So point oh seven times twelve is seven seven point four, eight point four, point eight four, something like this. But you get yeah one thousand eight hundred dollars something ish. That's a thousand dollars in twelve years. It more than doubled. It's pretty good. So you might ask yourself, what's the average increase of just the stock market in general? It's more than seven. It's about 11, actually. So now do it over. And let's say you hit average. Yeah, so now we're, now we're getting into it. Um, one year I had investments and I hit 27%. Wow, what if you had crazy good years every year for 12 years? Big number, isn't it? Right now, that's not what you're gonna get, right? But numbers like this certainly stroke that greed <laughs> that is in everybody a little bit. Um, yeah, uh, investment things are, are crazy to think about. I mean, it's 800 bucks, but over 12 years, you, it could go up to 3,000. That's, that's acceptable uh, in terms of stock investments or mutual fund investments. Um, yeah, I mean, it's 800 bucks, but it turns into 3,000 in 12 years. Come on. Um, this is the whole point. This is the whole reason why in financial classes, you're, you're often encouraged to invest at a young age. Because if you, if you put 800 in now and you retire in 45 years, One last computation, Let's see what that is. This $800 that you initially invest will turn into, what's the uh, 18,000 when you're older and retired, right? I mean, when you get out of this institution and you get a job, I don't know what kind of job you'll get, but you'll probably need at least this every couple of weeks. At least this. I would hope you make double this every couple of weeks. So to put away one week's worth of income and to see it mature into something like that, this is a very reasonable 
very reasonable estimate. That's a pretty crazy time. But this is also continuous compounding. And in stocks and things, it often does not compound continuously. It compounds quarterly or annually. So this is actually going to be higher than those. Okay. But still, investments, man. Don't let it, don't let it get to you. There's a lot of greed that happens with money. <laughs> so anyway, that's it for today. We're three minutes over. Sorry about that. So many computations about investments. Thanks for coming. It's good to see you all. I hope you have a good rest of the week. Thursday, that's tomorrow morning. I wrote an email yesterday. I moved office hours from the morning slot until an afternoon slot, 2 to 3.30. Okay? Um, if you can't make that time but you do have questions, just shoot me an email, and we can either make an appointment or we can, uh, I can answer via email. Okay? Um, thank you for joining us online, everybody. It's good to see you again. I'll see you next time, okay? Okay, bye.